I'm very pleased to, to, to welcome John Gilhouse. He's a very good friend of mine. I've known him for more than 20 years. Uh, we probably met here in the, the Bean Museum as he came to, uh, to look at the crane fly collections here. Uh, and, uh, and through the years, we've, uh, we've had many good times uh, with each other. John uh, comes from the Central Valley of California and, uh, and uh, got his bachelor's degree at uh, University of California at Davis, worked in the, the insect uh, collection and museum there, and uh, spent a good deal of his time going into San Francisco into the California Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park. Uh, we were in grad school together in different places. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of Kansas and uh, immediately got a postdoc at the Smithsonian, all to work on uh, uh, crane flies, oh, which he'll talk about crane flies. You'll see plenty of crane flies, I suspect, in a few minutes. Uh, and uh, then from there, he was hired immediately at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia. So uh, in one way of looking at things, he's worked for the about the three largest museums, uh, one exception, uh, in North America uh, through the years, uh, with the Smithsonian, the Cal Academy, and uh, and the, the Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, John Gelhouse started working in Mongolia a, a little bit more than 15 years ago, and uh, and then about 10 years ago, he involved me, about five years ago, he involved uh, me in those uh, expeditions to Mongolia. And it has totally changed my life. I am so grateful to John Gelhouse uh, for his uh, uh, work that he's done, for the uh, friendships we've had uh, collecting specimens across the desert southwest here in the United States, as well as Mongolia. And so with a great deal of respect, I'd like you to stand and uh, come forward, please. <laughs> this, uh, uh, Ank and uh, uh, Mandy, uh, Manduhai, could you come and help me? You, you say words in Mongolian that are appropriate at the right time, okay? <laughs> this, this cloth, this cloth, you, uh, She's fixing my hands properly, okay? Blue is a very important color to the Mongolians. This blue cloth is called a hatak, and the hatak is a sign of utmost respect. And I have nothing but respect for my good friend, John Gelhaus. Thank you, Riley. You're welcome. <laughs> Say something in Mongolian. <laughs> like, 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 uh, say, what's the score? <laughs> so let's hear from John Gale. Thank you, Riley, for that introduction. And let me get situated here with the technology. Okay. So I'm going to maybe go over here and we'll try it this way. Okay. So as Riley uh, said, I work on crane flies. I'll talk a little bit about that. But the talk today will be about our project in Mongolia. But first, I want to talk about my ties to BYU. Um, and I want to talk about, um, since this is the Tanner lecture and the Tanner family, um, I know the Tanners through Vasco Tanner, who was a, a longtime professor at BYU. I didn't know him, but I studied many specimens that he collected um, through his years and that are, are deposited here at the Bean Museum because uh, some of my work has been in Western North America and understanding the species of crane flies there. And um, without uh, other people collecting 
for us, gathering data, even though it's not data they're necessarily going to use, but it will be used by researchers a long time in the future, maybe hundreds of years in the future, will go back to these specimens. It's, uh, it's something quite of value, and uh, so uh, folks like Vasco Tanner, who was a beetle specialist, I think, and other things, but he certainly wasn't a crane fly specialist, but certainly I, it was his uh, uh, collections were very beneficial to me and to uh, one of the great crane fly specialists, uh, Charles Alexander, who wrote uh, at the time of uh, Dr. Tanner's retirement, may I express my deepest thanks and appreciation to Professor Tanner for a long and most profitable association. Um, and uh, Alexander actually described a couple species of crane flies for Dr. Tanner. There's a tipula tanneri that's known from Utah and Colorado. But that's not my only link to BYU. I first came here invited by Dr. Richard Bauman, who's sitting in the audience here. And um, as a fairly young PhD student, and uh, he invited me here and set me up in dormitory housing for maybe a week or so. And I got to work through the BYU collection. And I was working on a group that was all through the deserts of Western North America. And Dr. Bauman, who is a stonefly specialist, he doesn't work on crane flies, but he knew the value of, of collecting things that, that would be of use for researchers of the time and in the future. And his collections were very valuable for me, including things that were new to science or very rare in other collections. So it gave me a bigger picture, a much fuller picture of the understanding of this crane fly group and I uh, honored him with naming uh, w one of the uh, new species that I found that he collected the only specimens of, um, which is Tipula baumani. At that time, I met Riley when I was visiting here. So he wasn't riding a camel then. Which <laughs> And so Riley and I have been longtime colleagues since then, and we've done uh, we've uh, done work in the field in a variety of places. Uh, and uh, you know, he in San Francisco, and me in Philadelphia, and him in Texas, and now in Utah, and 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 our now uh, experiences in Mongolia. So that's been a wonderful association for me. And let me just say, just briefly about my own institution. Um, it's, it's. I'm a museum person. I come into the Bean Museum here, and I instantly feel at home and very excited. Like let me up into the collections, let me see what's there, what kind of new things, all of this kind of stuff. Because our research changes over the years and, and we might be working on a project now where we, weren't, that we want some specimens that we weren't paying too much attention to 20 years ago or whatever. So every time we go to a museum, uh, there are new things to find, plus what, new, what other people have collected. My museum's been around a long time. It's the oldest natural history museum in North America, founded in 1812 by a bunch of naturalists that said, let's gather our collections together, our libraries together, and let's talk ideas, and they form this institution. And so we have nearly 20 million specimens of plants and animals, and there's been a research back to the beginning on systematics and taxonomy, and in the last 50 years on aquatic ecology. So um, anyway, and we're located right downtown Philadelphia. Who am I? Well, I'm an aquatic entomologist. That's, I study insects that live at least part of their time in the water and wet situations. I'm a systematist, so I'm interested in what are the species on Earth? How did they, how did we, how did they get there? How did they evolve? What are their relationships among them? And I'm a dipterist. Well, diptera is the group that includes the flies. So I study flies. And in particular, I study one group of flies. Uh, 
the crane flies. Um, I'm sure you've all seen them. They're big, long-legged things. People think sometimes they're a giant mosquito, particularly, I would say, around here in the springtime. They might fly into houses following a light or something like that. They're completely harmless. Um, so here's some names for uh, crane flies, including the Mongolian term, Tamelskin, which I, if I understand it correct, means like a little camel. And, um, but, so these are crane flies. It's a big group. About 15,000 species have been described already for the world, and maybe there are 25,000 when we're all done. So a lot of diversity, and a lot of it hasn't been studied much. They can be found all the way from the Arctic to the subantarctic, from the high elevations to intertidal. And it's one of those families or groups of insects that um, you have species that are adapted to uh, aquatic situations and those that can be found in the terrestrial realm, in forests, in deserts, and the like. So I get to look at lots of different habitats. It's also an old group going all the way back to the Triassic. So they were, these guys were flying around when the dinosaurs were roaming the earth and, and such. These guys have hung on. The dinosaurs, well, I guess they're birds now, but anyway. So crane flies have taken me all over the world and uh, to wonderful places. And one of those is Mongolia, and that's what I'm going to talk about. When I was growing up as a kid, Mongolia was like the end of the world. I, you know, it was just hard to, to have a, what, anything about it, to know much about it. But to these Mongolian youngsters, it's the center of their world. And I was, I'm, have been very pleased to be a part of their world. Some people aren't quite sure where Mongolia is. It's not one of the superpowers, but it sits between two of them. So we have Russia and China, and, uh, and then the country of Mongolia, which is an independent country. Some, some people have termed it Outer Mongolia. I don't tend to like that term per se, but it contrast with the Chinese province of Inner Mongolia. So ethnic Mongolians occur throughout this region, but there's one independent country of Mongolia. And Mongolia is huge. If you look down on that, the map of the U.S., that's Mongolia superimposed on it. So it's about the size of our eastern United States, except that there are only about two and a half million people in all of Mongolia, which is less than the number of people in the metropolitan area of Philadelphia. For, so Mongolia has the lowest population density in Asia. So it's a vast land, but not heavily populated. Most people know, when you mention Mongolia, they know of Genghis Khan. And he conquered the largest empire the world has ever known. It stretched from the Pacific all the way to Eastern Europe. And its influences are still seen today in the, the uh, people that inhabit that region. It's also the land of just the roads that stretch forever through the endless steppe grasslands. Just a, a beautiful country. Plenty of streams and rivers, although it's a dry country, but there's certainly uh, quite a variety. And then just stunning landscapes. This happens to be one in the northern part of the country. Um, this maybe could be Utah or somewhere here in the U.S., but it, this is in Mongolia. Most people, even still today, are in the rural areas following a nomadic lifestyle, and that's based on uh, grazing animals, horse, sheep, goats, cows, and sometimes yaks, sometimes camels, and one family may have all of those animals as part of, of the herds that they have. And this is a lifestyle that's been followed for thousands of years. Here you can see um, uh, mostly goats and sheep, 
uh, Mongolian on horse, which is a primary method of transportation in uh, the rural areas. And then to the left there, you can see the Gurs. These are the, uh, the homes the Mongolians live in, very well adapted for their climate and the geography. They can be taken down fairly quickly and moved when the people need to move to new grazing lands. But a lot of people live in Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital of Mongolia and its largest city. When you, you, it's uh, reached a million residents, and I know that because a couple years ago, my student had a baby, and it was declared the millionth resident of Ulaanbaatar. And there was a whole big celebration, and she, they got a little, quite a bit of money and all of that kind of stuff. It wasn't the only baby. It was, there were like 45 born that day, and they were all the millionth resident. But anyway, so, but Ulaanbaatar is a vast, sprawling, very modern city, but also it's a city in the developing world. So surrounding it are Gur settlements where people are coming in from the countryside. They may not be able to afford apartments and things like that, but they're still living in around the city because that's where they can find opportunities opportunities for work and to get money. Um, so, But once you go from Ulaanbaatar of a million, I think the next largest town might be 40 or 50,000. So that's the disparity. You have one huge city and then a few much, much smaller ones and then many towns, small towns of 100 people, I mean 500 people or whatever. Mongolia was pretty much closed off to the west for most of the, the uh, 20th century. The Russians had uh, come in in the 20s, and it was a very controlled uh, economy and environment and government. But in 1990, the Mongolians asked the Russians to leave, and they did very, very quietly. Um, and uh, now Mongolia is a free market uh, uh, parliamentary democracy and has been since uh, 1990. This is a Rus Russian a settlement outside Choy Balsan and you can see it's, uh, this was back in the 90s absolutely stripped of everything. Well, my research, Riley's, and our colleagues all start with one person, and that's my colleague Clyde Golden at the Academy. And Clyde was a very well-known lake ecologist, and he, in 1994, was invited in by a Mongolian non-governmental group to look at Lake Hufskul, which was this beautiful lake in the north part of the country, and this group was concerned with maintaining the environmental health of Lake Club School. And so they knew of the Academy's research in aquatic ecology. They knew of Clyde. And Clyde went over there and he was sold. And he's worked in Mongolia ever since and really devoted the rest of his working life there. Um, and um, he came back and said this lake is one of the l last pristine Great Lakes of the world. It's a wonderful place to do scientific research and we really need to um, uh, do some work there. So we started at Lake Hood School. This is the lake here. If you've seen Lake Tahoe in California, Lake Hovskull reminds me very much of Lake Tahoe, which I knew well growing up. So fourth deepest lake in Asia, but the world's 14th largest source of fresh water. It's an extremely deep lake of, of really stunning clarity and uh, uh, really a wonderful place. So we got in there, we did some basic surveying of the streams and rivers. Uh, we did transects um, of the lake bottom using, I believe it was the only ship in the Mongolian nation. Mongolia is landlocked, so it doesn't really have any outlet to the sea. But there was a ship on, on Lake Hovskul. And what we found is, this is just basically showing, we found species, a lot of species that weren't known for Mongolia previously. 
and as well as new species um, of insects and diatoms, uh, algae, amphipods, and a variety of things in the lake. And we also found there was a core of species that were restricted to Mongolia. That is, of all the places in the world, you had to go to Mongolia to see these things. We call them endemics. And so that was, that's important to protect those areas because those are species that once they're gone from that area, they're not existing anywhere else. We also had some concerns as things went along with the with environmental conditions. Although the lake itself was stunning and in very good shape, the surrounding areas we could see mining was becoming very important and is probably more important to Mongolia's economy now than back then. Gold mining, this is a gold mining operation. This was a stream that flowed down here. They moved right down the stream corridor. And these are not uh, remediated afterwards from what I've seen. So this is a, just an ugly scar that will remain. You can see the local people, the GERS surrounding this. Their sources of water may be in here. Uh, coal mining is really important. China's buying up as much coal as it can get from Mongolia. The second largest copper mine in the world is in Mongolia. So and uh, now rare minerals are um, being sought in Mongolia because China has said we're not exporting any rare minerals anymore. So mining is very important to Mongolia. We already mentioned the traditional nomadic lifestyle. Grazing of animals is extremely important to Mongolia. Wherever you go in Mongolia, you're likely to see uh, animals grazing and people with their animals. But changes happened in Mongolia once uh, the Soviet economy was out of there. It was free market. Um, suddenly there were not really controls on how many animals somebody could have and where they could move them. And Mongolia didn't have a private ownership system of the grazing lands. This is all open land. The only places I've ever even seen any fencing is when we went to Western Mongolia. Otherwise, it's all open grassland. And so and so grazing animals have increased um, since that time. This is just a little graph here, 96 to 2000. You can see this is 20 million, 40 million animals. So there were some increases, decrease probably from uh, weather, and then a big increase here up into 2009 up to over 40 million animals, and then I had a horrible winter storm period, Azud, which, um, and particularly when pastures are overgrazed, animals are not in as good a condition going through the winter, and then you have a late winter storm, particularly with ice and heavy snow that covers up what's left of the forage, and you get huge losses of animals. And at one point during the winter of 2009-10, there were up to a million animals dying a week. So it was a tremendous loss. Um, the animals that are prime, in numbers anyway, sheep and goats are the main uh, animals in Mongolia, but certainly horse and cows and camels are important, but in terms of the numbers, sheep and goats. Sheep, wool, and meat, primarily local, a use of meat. Um, goats is the cashmere market, and the, that's far more lucrative than selling wool or selling meat. But the Mongolians use all these animals for a variety of uses. Mongolia's water resources are limited. And uh, so surface water, we need to be concerned about that. And water quality, that we maintain the water quality when you're in a dry area. Utah's in a dry area. I live in New Jersey. It's very wet. Well, it's not always wet. So we all have to be kind of cognizant of that. We've had droughts in New Jersey where they're very concerned that they'll meet the demands for water. Mongolia definitely is a country that has to be concerned about it. This is ditching here from a stream. I never saw any of this in the 
par central part of Mongolia, but we saw a lot of this in western Mongolia, which is drier. Here they fenced off an area, they're irrigating it, trying to get more grass to grow. Um, this is in the summer, it's fenced off from animals, so they're doing this for winter uh, forage. And then global climate change is happening, whether we like it or not. The climate is increasing even in Mongolia. And Mongolia has permafrost, frozen areas, uh, subsoil uh, sub areas that remain frozen. But it's on the edge of the permafrost, and that is the, a real telltale uh, area where you're getting climate change. Those areas are going to change right away, and you're going to see the changes right away. So as that permafrost melts, as that frozen part, permanently frozen part, goes deeper, you start to get other effects on surface water, including warming of the surface water, and also streams that were once permanent now become intermittent. They don't flow all the time. And the local herdsmen have told us that. This stream used to flow. We could count on it all the time. Now it doesn't flow all the time. We can't count that we're going to get water there. So with all of that, we decided, um, my colleagues and I, to develop the Mongolian Aquatic Insect Survey. And so we sought out funding, and we were able to get those projects going. Now I want to point out Riley's uh, here, too. So why aquatic insects? Why should they be involved with with water quality and and uh, mountain and everything? Well, insects are the most diverse group of organisms in water, so that's important. Um, and insects have different responses to um, things that affect water. Think of the various pollutants. Well, insects respond differently. Some aren't affected by mine drainage. Some are severely affected and they die out of the system. Some are affected by erosion. Some not so much or maybe that may increase for them. That might be something they they uh, actually like. So we look at what it, what uh, insects are in a particular sample. Which ones are, are sensitive insects that drop out of the system right away when there's uh, any kind of effects? And which ones are pretty tolerant of pollution and things? The group Riley and Dr. Uh, Bauman study, the stoneflies are considered a sensitive group. So um, they're one of those that if there's any kind of pollution problems, those their diversity tends to drop considerably. So by looking at insects, we can use that in a biological monitoring program. And this is standard now, all throughout the developed world. Every state, every state of the union um, has a, a monitoring program where they go out and sample insects in streams and rivers. I think New Jersey has... 600 sites that they look they look at at some kind of routine basis. So not only are you sampling the water chemistry, but you're also looking at the insects. Water chemistry, you can sample it today and see something. You could go several days later and the chemical is washed out of the system. But if that chemical affected the insect communities, there you're going to see those effects long term. So you need to have both. So how does that affect me? I'm not one that's doing that kind of work necessarily, but to do that kind of work, you need to have an accurate identification of what insects are there, because in that way you can figure out whether you have sensitive and tolerant species. And so understanding the identifications, providing the identification tools, those are really key roles that people like myself serve, taxonomists, systematists. So our Mongolian survey really is to provide that underlying knowledge um, so that they can be used in water quality monitoring. So we set up kind of three components. Uh, a field research component, we go out and sample across the country. Uh, taxonomic research, we identify what we've got. And then we need to also build the scientific infrastructure in Mongolia, the, the training, build labs, um, these kind of things. Because Mongolia is still 
and will continue for some time to be a poor country and it needs that kind of support and help. So where do we sample? So um, let me I keep needing the pointer and not having it. So let's try this out. Okay. So up here is Lake Hoopskull. This is where I started out. So it's up here in the northern part of the country. And Ulaanbaatar is somewhere right around in here. So that's where I started. Our first project with the Mongolian Aquatic Insect Survey was to sample this big drainage basin, the Selang Basin, which flows north into Baikal Lake, the world's largest and oldest lake, and then up into the Arctic Ocean. Our current project is here working in the west, here. And these are all closed basins. The streams flow down here into the lakes, and they don't go any further. That water is, stays within Mongolia, and it doesn't go out. And that's very similar to the Great Basin here. And, uh, you know, with these basin lakes, the water goes down into those lakes, but doesn't flow anywhere else, doesn't continue on. This is, so we've, this is our work from 2008, 9, and 10, and then this is what's projected for this summer to sample, this, this region here north of the Gobi. The Gobi Desert is right down here. So an expedition, sampling expedition, takes a lot of planning and particularly when we started in Mongolia, there were a lot of things to think about. Um, so um, there are no Walmarts. It's not easy to just, you know, call up the camping, you know, go on online and order a tent a few days before you're, you know, before you need to take it on expedition. It's very difficult to bring stuff into Mongolia. It takes a long time and it's very expensive. So we really had to think about that. So. Um, like here, most equipment and many supplies just aren't available into Mongolia. It's changing, but it certainly is, it, it's difficult. It's difficult for Mongolians to get things. Um, maps, uh, particularly when we started, are, were pretty unreliable. The, what they were using, topographic maps, were from the Soviet times. And many Mongolians had no access to those maps. Um, so you certainly need to discuss with people where you want to go and if they had been there, so their ideas. And the re one reason is, and I'll show you, is the road system is really, really bad. So that's always a consideration. We had to be there at the right time to sample. We wanted to sample aquatic insects, not only the stages in the water, but the adult stages flying around because we wanted to match up those two stages that we, you know, we needed to do that. So that meant we needed to be there in the summer when those adults were emerging and flying. We couldn't go in October or January. Um, we needed a good sampling team. We needed to be, it needed to be comprehensive. Everybody had a role to play and we needed to make sure we had people for all those roles. And we needed a good support staff. We needed people to drive. Mongolian drivers, we needed cooks because we had a large team, and we needed somebody to manage the operation on the ground. I don't speak Mongolian, so I needed somebody I could communicate with who could communicate with the drivers, who could communicate with the cooks. And uh, so that was very important. The last thing is we need to have permission. We need to have the permits to go out and do the sampling, to go into the national parks if we needed to. Uh, I found out we needed border permissions. I found that out when we got stopped <laughs> near the border and we're told, you know, you need a permit. So those are things you kind of learn. But um, so anyway, a lot of things that come about for that. This is our 2003 sampling group. This was before Riley joined us. But you can see it's a large group. And every year it seemed to get a little bit larger. I guess I'm not a good person saying no. And when I have a, a Mongolian researcher who comes up to me and says, 
can I go it would be really helpful for me. But you can see everybody has a group that they're in charge of sampling. And then we have drivers, and we have our cooks that are there, and um, so everybody had a role. Here was our manager for the first year, and uh, so it's great. And this is an international team, Europeans, Mongolian researchers, and U.S. researchers. So there were lots of languages being thrown around the camp. Um, Mongolian, Mongolia at the time we started, there were not many uh, scientists. There certainly weren't many entomologists. The two that I knew of both studied the same beetle family. <laughs> so you had two in the whole country and they both were studying uh, tenebrionids or I forget, yeah, but they were both studying beetles anyway. And uh, this was one, Dr. Namhai Dorsh. He was at the Mongolian Academy of Sciences and he started with us. He had a lot of field experience in Mongolia, which I really appreciated. And he was also very willing to to teach us about natural history of Mongolia and the culture. So that worked out very well for us. Mongolia is a cash economy. In Ulaanbaatar, you can use credit cards some. But once you get outside the capital city, forget it. You have to have cash to buy gasoline. Uh, we often use local drivers, so when we would leave, they needed to be paid. And um, food. Food was another issue. Just finding a lot of things outside the capital were a problem. So we usually bought everything we could in the capital. But anyway, that meant that John, me, was getting going to the bank and taking thousands of dollars of U.S. dollars out and and converting them to Mongolian tugrits. And a tugrit was anywhere from twelve to fourteen hundred tugrits to a dollar. So uh, think three, four thousand dollars converted to two grits. It was a lot of money. Excuse me, went the wrong way. Um, these are 20,000 two grit notes, 5,000, 10,000. Those are, that was the common currency, basically, that uh, I used. And I had stacks of it. We don't carry stacks of money around here. <laughs> it's a very strange thing <laughs> to have a briefcase full of stacks of money. You feel like you're doing something nefarious or something but that's what it was and you know but I was with a group of people we all respected I loved and honored each other I never had much concern that anything was going to happen everybody kind of the drivers and everything were always watching out for us so I never had any bad experiences with it but I wasn't comfortable with all that I mentioned the road systems Ulaanbaatar is paved and a couple roads extend out maybe about 100 kilometers that are paved, but not well maintained. They're a little bit like New Jersey roads actually paved after the winter. But after that, it's all dirt roads and of uneven quality. And some of, uh, we've been on some of the worst. This was up around Lake Hovskol, which still, after years and years of working in Mongolia, those are absolutely the worst roads I have ever been on in my life. This, this was a mire uh, soon after thaw, and we, tra we stuck every Jeep, every Jeep got stuck in there, and um, that was a mess. Um, bridges, as I said, Mongolia is a poor country. It takes a lot of money to maintain uh, to maintain like things like bridges, and particularly when you get huge floods that come down and wash out bridges. So we usually did not expect to use a bridge, and if a bridge was there, it may not have been very well maintained, and the drivers would tend to do a low, cro a low water crossing anyway. So we, uh, Riley and I, are very experienced with crossing um, all kinds of streams and rivers in Russian jeeps. That you can't throw too much at us that is going to bother us about that. Drivers generally will go about anywhere. They will figure it out. But in this place here, I learned what a winter road was because they said 
it's impossible, we're not going further. And this is a winter road. You only drive that when it's frozen in the winter. Otherwise, it's an absolute marshy mire. And we, we wanted to get over here about two kilometers. So the whole team hiked through that and we did our sampling. But this was one of the few times drivers said, no way, we can't go. Um, you might think there are no dealerships out in the countryside, cars break down, the drivers own the vehicles and they know how to fix them, they help each other, they usually take some spare parts and we've never been absolutely stopped by vehicle problems. We've had lots of vehicle problems but they've always kind of worked that out. But that's another thing you have to worry about. And the last thing is Gas stations are few and far between, so whenever we'd get near one, the driver said, we probably should fill up, and we always took extra and such. But you would, I would kind of worry we'd get out along one pass too far, and what if we ran out and couldn't make our way back? I never could quite figure out how we would do that. It's never, it never came up. But it's just something to think about when you're in a country that it doesn't have the things that we have. So, this is a little video of Riley's, and Kay, I, he said I really shouldn't show this to you, but anyway. Um, but these are some of the things that you encounter. Riley said, did you see the refrigerator going down there? I said, no, I didn't see that. He said, well, it was a refrigerator-sized rock that was washed down there. Uh, what he said not to tell Kay is that we actually crossed that. <laughs> At least he <in> did. <laughs> yes. Well, let's see. Move on. We even took helicopters one year to get to a high mountain area that we couldn't uh, we couldn't reach uh, by vehicle. Here's another, just a little clip. Oops. Um, there we go. Oh. This is the way traveling is. It can be really quite special and beautiful. That's Nam Haidorsh there. Baga, one of our drivers for many years. The horse flies here following us. So there there can be a beautiful rhythm and I don't know how to say it, but just really quite a, a wonderful thing about it. But there are long distances to go in Mongolia. So there is a lot of that kind of traveling. Um, People think we're on vacation when we go to Mongolia. I think a lot of scientists get that when they go somewhere else and, oh, you're having such fun. It is fun, but it's a lot of work. So my day would start at 6 or 7. Um, I would pin or paper a lot of my materials, so I'm in there doing that kind of work. Um, then we would pack up camp. We moved camp every day, uh, pretty much. So we'd pack up our camp. We'd travel to another sampling site. If, we were, if it fit, we would have lunch there. Otherwise, we might go to another site and have lunch. And then somewhere around this period, 6, 7 o'clock, we'd be looking for our next campsite. We'd have to set up camp again. 
Um, you know, cooks would start their dinners and stuff like that. Then we would all go and sample because in summer, that time of year, it's late. Uh, I mean, it's light very late in the day. Um, at some point, you try to grab dinner while, while this is going on. And then some, of, some people might be running a light trap or doing other things. And then you kind of fall into bed. Um, let's see, I can move it from here. Here's my girl in the first project. And I know this was a two-day campsite because I actually could do some laundry and hang out clothes. Most of the time that doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, it's rainy or whatever. But we take advantage of what we can. We don't do without our laptops, without our... Um, uh, digital cameras and the like. We have generators, and these things are used all the time. And Mongolia is great for cell phones. Mo all Mongolians have cell phones, and now even in the countryside, you can get cell service in a lot of different places. So cell phone batteries were being charged quite a bit. Mongolians, as I said, it's a nomadic lifestyle, and Mongolian food is very heavily meat and dairy. And so that's, and that is very much adaptive to their environment. And, and it's not a place where there's going to be a lot of vegetables grown and things like that. We, you don't find them a lot in the rural markets. So everything we, all of that kind of fresh stuff primarily was taken from the capital. And by about a week and a half or two weeks into a trip, all of that was gone. So we ate a lot of mutton and um, um, often would buy animals from the local people, which helped them. And also we got fresh meat. Our drivers would um, uh, kill the sheep and dress them, and we'd eat that meat for a while with a group of anywhere from 17 to 22 or 3 people. Uh, sheep didn't last too long, actually. Um, dairy products, uh, when we were lucky to find it, it was wonderful to get yogurt. Um, sometimes we got uh, cheese um, and even butter and such like that. Um, and, and a simple cuisine of, uh, say, a mutton soup or a type of stir-fry or things like that. Meals were pretty basic. The modern-day Mongol horde, I think, are the biting flies. And uh, you don't find them everywhere in Mongolia. In fact, you find the places that, where the people don't graze animals in the summer is be probably because of all the biting flies. Those are probably winter pastures. Um, and uh, this was up in one of the national parks. And this is our cook Gurla's back. And just uh, there are horse flies here, deer flies, uh, black flies, mosquitoes, noceums, and then face flies, which don't bite, but just get everywhere. And this one place, I remember, had everything. And you can see we're trying to eat lunch. Some people have head nets, some people have claws and such like that. That's just another one of those things you face in Mongolia. It's not everywhere, like I said, but it can be intense where it is. Uh, and then one thing when we're traveling around, religion is, is very much evident in a, a lot of the country. But that, I don't think, was always the case. In fact, during the Soviet period, uh, the uh, Buddhist religion and the shamanistic, shamanistic traditions were really brutally suppressed. And thousands of Buddhist monks were slaughtered in the 30s. And most of the mon monasteries were, were tore down to absolute rubble. But you see signs of that uh, coming back. So here's um, uh, Honda, our expedition manager who's well school schooled in Tibetan and, and the Buddhism is a form of Tibetan Buddhism. So she's teaching us about that. You see the uh, Buddhist and shamanistic kind of signs together. This is an ovo which marks uh, often a a place, a, a tough place of travel. I've seen high mountain passes and the like. And this is one of these ancient man stones. And here you have the blue cloth wrapped around it. And um, 
So our sampling areas, you can see we covered a lot of the country, three over almost 400 sites. A variety of collecting methods. I'm not going to go into that, but just all kinds of uh, like sweep netting and various traps for adults. And then all the work uh, collecting the larval stages in the water. Here was our, our benthic. This was the, uh, one of the teams that sampled in the water, doing the water chemistry. Here's the water chemistry kits and the nets for sampling in the rivers. I'm going to actually pass by this as of time. I wanted to show this. This is a very common terrestrial insect in Mongolia. We uh, we collect a lot of terrestrial insects, even though that's I, I collect for a lot of people because because Mongolia is a big hole entomologically, a big black hole. There isn't a lot known, but this is in the group that includes the Mormon cricket, so um, it's probably very familiar to some. Some of you. What results from all that sampling? This is one year of sampling in 2003. I brought all the collections together and you can see it's a wide variety. There's s samples in alcohol, pin specimens, specimens in envelopes. Here's a dragonfly. My crane flies are often that way. So a wide variety of collections. Um, not all of it gets identified right away. We focus. We do our target. And I talked about developing scientific infrastructure. Well, one thing is Mongolia doesn't, didn't at the time and still doesn't have a lot of things like equipment, well-equipped libraries for the students, computers, and things like that. Like I said, it's changing, but, but they didn't when we started. And so I actually became a shipper, which I had no idea how to do that, but we had a lot of things we needed to ship over there. And so I arranged for a container in 2004 and again in 2009 and we bought all kinds of supplies and equipments and museum cabinets and the like and um, a container was rolled up, a moving company packed it full that was uh, 20 feet by 8 by 8 so it was a lot of material and that container headed off to New York into China and then two months later arrived in Mongolia and so it supplied all our lab and it supplied labs in the several universities and the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. Here was our here's our lab, the Mongolian Aquatic Insect Laboratory in the Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, the the institute that does climate and water resources. Training um, is also a big part of developing infrastructure. Um, this is, in the yellow, are all the different young Mongolian researchers that were involved in our project over the years. Their specialties and where we took, we took, we sent them to the people that they needed to learn from. Some of those were in Europe, some of those were in the United States, and um, and, uh, and a number of these students have gone on to graduate school in Mongolia or in the U.S. Here's a student I've worked with a lot, Oyuna. Sana came here to BYU and worked with Riley. Um, and um, so anyway, this was a big part of our project, was training these researchers so that they could be world scientists. And part of that is making presentations and publishing. So to date, we're at 141 presentations and 109 publications of a, of a variety of different uh, areas. Here's two, this is the Benthological Society meeting in Santa Fe last year with some students and our researchers. Here's Clyde Golden and Riley. And, and then this was the first uh, biomonitoring conference in Mongolia, an international conference. My postdoc, uh, Alan Masri, um, and our Mongolian researchers. Here's Suvda, Boluru, Nasa, and Ogna. So 
So we've done a lot of work in identifying aquatic insects. This just lists all the different groups. And all these colors you don't have to worry about except to realize orange are Mongolian researchers, blue are European, and white are U.S. So you can see this is truly an international effort even at the stage of looking at one group of organisms. We have a variety of different people. So many of the aquatic groups have been worked up and published or manuscripts are, are going. Um, so what have we found? Well, we're up to about 1,300 species of aquatic insects in Mongolia. About a third of those are known because of the efforts of our project. So we've added substantially the number of species now known for Mongolia, as well as all the distributions of those species. So it's not just finding the species for the country and checking it, but we might have a number of locations now where we know the distribution of that species within Mongolia and something about its, its uh, the habitats that it prefers. Um, and we've got about not too many new species. That hasn't been a very strong portion of what we've found in Mongolia. Only about 19 so far. So once we start to know the species, we can do all kinds of other things. We can help with identification aids, we can help with ecological and behavioral studies, and also development of the criteria for biomonitoring. And, and this really does help ecologists, land managers, policy makers, and as Riley said, this all leads to helping the nomads of Mongolia. So I'll just go into a little bit. I'm going to focus mostly on BYU participation and students. This is work by Riley's uh, student, Sarah Judson and Riley. And this is an identification guide to stone, stoneflies. And this is really quite a wonderful, beautiful document that they've put together. Photographs showing the important features. Um, this is what we call an identification key, which gives you a choice of characters and you move on from that and eventually you get to an identification. So this for U.S. scientists is a wonderful tool. For Mongolian scientists, this is really uh, incredibly useful for them. They don't have that. They don't have access to even the literature if there was literature and there wasn't for for this here. This was all um, a really a wonderful step forward. We found some pretty interesting, uh, interesting bugs. These are skating caddisflies. Adult caddisflies are kind of moth-like. They fly around, but these guys don't fly. They skate along the surface of the water. You can see it there. Look how fast it's going. It's modified its legs and using the wings to propel it around. So it never, it doesn't fly anymore. There's only about 11 of these species, species that do this, known for the world, for caddisflies. Two of them are in Mongolia. Um, so that, and um, both of these skaters were new species. We're using techniques like molecular techniques to try to understand the species. And so this is a technique called DNA barcoding, which is basically a just short region of DNA that appears to be distinctive to species. And what we had here was a new species of crane fly, which we couldn't quite figure out even what genus to put it in. And we were interested in what the uh, larvae looked like, but we didn't know the larvae. But we did have some strange larvae from the same site. Uh, we wanted to know if they were the same thing. So we were able to use a Mongolian graduate student who had kind of built a library of these DNA sequences for a lot of the crane flies. And so we ran the larvae and the adult sequences, and they matched up perfectly, which gave us an indication we were dealing with two stages of the same species. 
this is Sarah's work again. And I want to, this is really quite interesting stuff. Sarah again, a BYU student. So what she wanted to do was, we have all this data on stoneflies. Can we build a predictable model? We haven't been everywhere in Mongolia. Can we predict where these species could be found or should be found? And that's what, so she looked at a lot of characteristics, databases she was able to find, um, not necessarily our data, but mean temperature and precipitation and drainage and elevation and the like, and ran that and found certain factors were very predictive of where stoneflies would be found. And that's what's showing here. These orange areas are hot spots for finding stoneflies. So you, these are areas that definitely should be intensively sampled if you wanted to understand more where the stoneflies occurred in Mongolia. And this technique that she did can be adapted for all of the aquatic insect groups. So this is a really quite uh, wonderful contribution by Sarah. And Riley in 2010, um, this, her model was produced in 2009. So in 2010, um, we sampled this region here, Uv's region. So Riley took her predictions of what species should be in here and actually used that as he was sampling. And he reports that they came out exactly the way you, he had hoped they would. That is, he did find those species. Her model worked very well. One other area we haven't sampled is out here in these eastern rivers. And so now Sarah's predictive model can give Riley a sense of what he might expect to find out there. Livestock grazing, as I said, is found really at most sites we visit, there is evidence of livestock. Sometimes active, sometimes not. not um, sometimes maybe it's a winter grazing period. But so, And we know effect, livestock can have effects on the environment and on streams. So they can, if you have a lot of in, uh, intensive grazing, they can erode the stream banks. They can really cause a decline in the vegetation along the stream corridor. And they can enrich the stream in nutrients just from their fecal material. So not only erosion particles, but nutrients from the fecal material and such. So that was something we were kind of interested in. Are Mongolian herd sizes at a level to really impact the functioning of the streams? So here's another BY student. This is an undergraduate. Uh, these are actually three undergraduate students. Here's Paul Franson here. Uh, Josh Wirtz was involved. And Tristan McKnight, who's sitting in the back, was also involved. And this was a study setting out these yellow pans with some detergent water and doing an hour sampling of the insects that ended up in these yellow pans. And then they analyzed this, and they found that the diversity of the insects was really significantly less in high-impacted riparian zones, where those impacts were grazing and erosion. So based on this study, it did appear that there certainly were sites where grazing were having an impact on the local insect fauna. Barbara and I, Barbara Hayford and I, this is Barbara Hayford here, one of my colleagues, she and I took our field data sheets. So these were, when we finished a, a site, we would ask everybody, what'd you find, what'd you find? And we wrote it down. So we decided, let's take this data as a quick assessment and see what it can tell us about stream conditions. So she, we had a set of criteria, 45 streams kind of fit that criteria, and we had 74 groups of insects, so a high diversity of insects um, you can see listed here, many different groups of insects to use in that analysis. There we go. Now we found something a little different than Riley and his students. One is that different groups of insects were impacted differently by grazing and erosion. So Diptera, my group, 
flies, which are often considered kind of tolerant as a group, and stoneflies, which are considered sensitive as a group, their diversity was highest in those streams which had less erosion and less grazing. Okay? Now, caddisflies and mayflies, Trichoptera and Ephemeroptera, those are both considered kind of sensitive taxa, but yet their diversity was higher in streams where you had some grazing going on. So grazing wasn't necessarily a bad thing. The disturbance apparently um, at some level was, was, um, could be beneficial to the stream community. So just based on this study, we felt most communities, at least of adult insect, aquatic insects, were really not strongly impacted by grazing yet. I re realized that grazing in Mongolia has been going on for thousands of years. So that may be influencing some of what we are seeing. And my postdoc, Dr. Masri, now has been um, actually we were talking about erosion and the level of grazing. Well, now he's trying to incorporate the actual number of animals in a watershed. And so he's figured out how to convert goats and sheep and the like into a unit that they call the cattle unit. And so now he looks at everything in cattle units. And what he's shown is that... Um, uh, some streams are showing enrichment of nutrients and erosion uh, where they have higher levels of livestock grazing in the watershed. So right now he's taking all of our benthic insect data and starting to analyze that. And one of the things we're looking at is these in western Mongolia, this stream here, this area here, these seem to be winter grazed areas. They're kind of protected. There's no grazing in the summer in these areas. You can see these look beautiful. There's nice riparian vegetation and the like here. This is even fenced here. And, um, and yet in the high elevation areas, the Mongol, uh, at least in western Mongolia, those are the areas they're grazing in the summertime. And those areas are really impacted. The riparian zones are very bad. So he, uh, my postdoc is looking at whether areas that have high diversity of insects, high water quality, those might be recommendations to make that those areas remain as winter grazed areas. When the ground is frozen, the animals will have less impact on the streams. And uh, those areas will tend to protect that high diversity in the water quality. So that's something that we're going to look at that might lead to a sustainable herding. So I'm a little long, I'm afraid, uh, but anyway, in conclusion, uh, the inventories of the species really are our first step, and it's taken us a while to get to that, um, along with the training and the like, but I think we're pretty much there. So de development of these identification guides and that expertise really opens the door for other students, other researchers now, to start using aquatic insects in understanding streams and, and how they're functioning. And um, so that, that really brings research into a lot of different areas, including ecology and behavior. So I just want to acknowledge particularly the National Science Foundation, the U.S. National Science Foundation. Um, uh, it, gets a, it sometimes gets a lot of flack, but these are, are peer-reviewed, heavily competitive grants. If you get one, it's been through a lot of review. And, um, so, and this is money that's allowed us to do that research in Mongolia and work in Mongolia. And, and then a lot, this is not a complete list, this, but you can see lots of different people involved in this research. Thank you, that's my girl, and this looks like Utah, I think, but it's not. It's somewhere in Western Mongolia. And this is a slide from Riley. These are the folks who sample, identify, present, and publish their resu results for the Mongolian Aquatic Insect Survey. Thank you very much.
I know they're a little, we're a little long. If anyone has any questions, I guess I could take a couple. And uh, if anyone have the score? Oh, uh, I thought it was a little subdued in here. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Well, yes. How, how did you measure and determine the different levels of erosion? It was it was visual, yeah. So they we set up kind of uh, categories of, of visual measurement, and the same goes with the grazing intensity. So uh, my colleague actually they did uh, the last year or so they went out with frames and threw those randomly out to measure the amount of vegetation that was there, and I think also. Uh, how much fecal material was there as as a measurement of grazing. But that's why my postdoc, I think, was very interested in really figuring out how many animals really are in the watershed. So that, and, and he was able to link that with our visual measurements of erosion and with the visual measurements of grazing intensity. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes. Do they have those skater flies? Because I remember seeing something like that. Well, they, we have, you know, like the water strider uh, insects. Those are we know those because we see them everywhere. But in certain groups, you don't expect that. In caddisflies, I didn't. And with the, only 11 species doing that, they're all lake species. Um, that's a really kind of a very interesting adaptation. And I was telling Riley, uh, one of my colleagues has. Sh shown me video and we're now working on a paper where a crane fly has actually adapted that and they show the same kind of morphological adaptions of the legs that the caddis flies are doing totally convergent they're not obviously not related at all but the functioning must uh, really have a strong selection for certain characteristics of those legs and the crane fly is doing the same thing skating on the surface of the water and using the wings to propel itself along so it's really pretty neat stuff yeah you know. Yeah, that was a that was actual caddis fly. Usually they they fly around, uh, you know, around the area. But these have adapted to the to some of the lake environments and do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I really have enjoyed being here. <laughs>